Guys, thank you so much for coming. My name is James Leinhart. I am the CEO and founder of Levitex Posture Care, um, and I'm a sleep posture expert. So we do a lot of work in elite sports. Um, I am a late diagnosed ADHD combat. Augmented reality sport. So come down to the have a go area and come and see me later. Hello, um, I'm G Griffiths. I'm the commissioner for wheelchair American football in the UK. It's a brand new sport. Uh, basically I've created for the UK, written all the rules, what have you. So we're here today introducing it, promoting it, and hopefully going to make some contacts so we can set some teams up. Uh, good morning, I'm Andy Credit from Birmingham Wheelchair Basketball and Make Change. We do inclusive adaptive sport all over the country, um, delivering inclusive adaptive sport, wheelchair basketball, inclusion squash, any, any sport that you can think of, we adapt to suit the needs of the individual and the participant. Um, yeah, that, that's who we are. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Matt Brinkley from Therapy Gyms Limited. Come away from the mic, it's a bit of feedback. Um, we provide inclusive exercise opportunities uh, in gyms in the community. And um, yeah, we, our goal really is just to... Uh, support people to participate in physical activity. That's everyone. Um, thank you very much all for coming. So, we're going to kick off the first question. I'm actually going to ask Matt, oh, you, how coincidental you're holding the microphone. That's perfect. As if we've been practicing this for hours. Um, and the question goes like this. How can sports organizations and facilities improve their accessibility features to accommodate the diverse needs of disabled individuals? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's something that really is, um, you know, needed to be done nationally and, well, potentially globally as well. Um, the, the key thing really for me is the, um, the guidance and support from the, that the professionals need in the first place to support people um, in an inclusive, accessible manner. Um, for us as a business, for example, we do receive inquiries from people looking for our services um, across England and we can't just reach out to everyone because at the moment we're based in Essex and Suffolk. Me then trying to reach out to, to find someone that can support that individual is the hardest thing. So from the start really, the, in terms of leisure and facilities, there needs to be some support given to those providers to actually be more inclusive, be more accessible. And um, that's, that's sort of where, where we're going at the moment, trying to build that awareness and support people to do so. I suppose it, it would make sense to pass the mic over to Andy and just to ask, given that you keep ac making every uh, sport so accessible, do you think that there's a lack of a, a framework that where you want to come and start and be involved in accessible sport that there's nothing, there's no real guidance and you, you, it seems like, a, and you, I'm not answering your question for you, that you're probably building this as you go along and if it doesn't exist already? Um, we was born out of the Commonwealth Games. I mean, we, you know, Birmingham Wheelchair Basketball started about five years ago and since we were asked by the Commonwealth Games, Birmingham Commonwealth Games to deliver all the community games, road shows, um, which was actually 36 road shows in, in, with partic of 38,000 participants engaging in wheelchair basketball, uh, different inclusive adaptive sports, and general sport as well. Um, I mean, most of our team are, will have a disability. I have 11 fractures in my spine, but I'm not paralyzed because my nerve ends are intact, so I, can, I see both worlds, um, which is a bit strange in some respects because obviously I'm a part-time wheelchair user uh, and I can walk as well. Um, so obviously when we go into schools, colleges, universities, delivery groups and organisations, we talk about accessibility and I mean one occasion working with the Commonwealth Games and you think about facilities that have accessibility, you know, we have, we have a world champion power archer in our, in our team, you know, working with the Commonwealth Games, going to a facility to deliver, you know, these kind of activities and inclusive sport and, you know, when it rains, you, you have a contingency plan to go inside somewhere, but when you think about design of buildings and from a squash court point of view, for a wheelchair user to get into a squash court, it's, it's non-existent because they're not designed. So I think when, when you think about accessibility, you've got to think about the facilities themselves and, and maybe work with um, 
people already who have a disability to be on that panel and discuss these things and work forward to think about how does access to be what does access to be mean how it works so moving forward yeah we we you know we deliver workshops now we go across different local authorities and you know we we embrace what we do because that's really important to where we move forward as a community and socially as well so that's i think that answers the question yeah absolutely and i suppose one of the interesting points you just made there was would you say overall there's a lack of engagement from within as in where there is panels required where, where we're dealing with accessibility that there's not enough people that actually require the accessibility that are on those decision making panels do you think quite often that it's people who don't have a need are the ones making the decisions on the accessibility and actually there's not enough, you know, by the people who are actually going to use those, those accessible, do you see what I'm saying? Is, is that, feels to me like we, we guys I've, have got the inside track, maybe we could help a bit more with making I, accessibility. I, I think that's right. I think I, I, from a grassroots point of view, I, I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, you know, I acquired my disability, um, was medically retired, had nowhere to go, and you know, moving forward as a community with you know, especially a person with a disability and understanding that and going to the schools and showcasing what we do on a regular basis, we're trying to change that that kind of mentality and that mindset. And and you know, we need people with a disability to be on those panels. And yeah, we we have that in the likes of Baroness Tanny Gay Thompson and supporting those those kind of things. But at grassroots level, I think it's a very slow process as well. And I think there's a struggle sometimes with regards to, to move a lot faster in the community to support accessibility and to, and to make that change. And, and Miranda, I wonder uh, over to you if, with regard to accessibility, is something that you found has been a challenge in terms of you able to provide the, the work that you do? Yeah, as we are predominantly online, you know, we have to think about web accessibility. Um, but really co-creation is a massive point for us because we have such a huge span of disability. You know, we have to get feedback and we have to iterate and we have to make sure that we have an advisory council made up of all different types of impairments, you know? So we really work closely with the disabled community to create our offering. And accessible web accessibility, of course, making everything uh, accessible on the web as to a highest standard as we can, yeah. And, and Shelley, given See, I think you're the most, um, you have the most, uh, in terms of your CV, I think this is really a question for you. In terms of when you've been working at UK Athletics, how have you found the framework and the speed of movements? Because of course, the bigger the organization, the slower the change. And uh, presumably you guys mm -hmm. should be the, the market leader, as it were, in flying the accessibility flag. Um, yeah, I mean, when I first started, we only had six competitions for para. Um, which for me was, oh, it was just competitions around the UK, just for athletics, right. but it was I only just that, yeah. for para-athletes, but it was, it was separate right. to the mainstream athletics. And I was like, well, why is it separate? You know, there's, there's no difference. We can in integrate quite easily. So I started working with the um, Northern Athletics Association to try and integrate para-athletics. And when I did, we had 55 athletes sign up and it turned into one of the best competitions. We had athletes coming from all over the world to come and compete because it was an integrated competition and they saw value in that. And then when, when I was chatting to the organizers, they were like, oh my God, we didn't realize what it would bring to the track. And then we got more, more people coming in, there was crowds coming in, people that never thought they would ever see a para and a mainstream competition be integrated. So it, it took off from there, but one of, the, one of the biggest things when I worked at UKA was I did work on the Paralympic program. I didn't want to work on the Olympic program, even though I was an Olympian, because I wanted to feel challenged and I wanted to help the side that was left behind. And I mean, I get quite upset. You know, it's really important. We, we, the beauty of this ex, of this conference, it feels to me, having worked in, in many, mm. is that it seems like the first conference in this space where actually this has been designed for the people, by the people, and actually we're all bringing our personal experience and mm. sharing it as a community. Oh, and gotcha. so Apologies. we're going to take a breath <laughs> and we're going to jump on to the next question. We're going to come oh, back sorry. to this hold point. On, hold on. You I'm good? all right. I'm all right, yeah. So I, I started building a folder 
and one of the biggest things that I found was a lot of the tracks were not accessible. And when you've got a wheelchair user that can't actually physically get onto the track without assistance, for me, that's exclusion, not inclusion. So we had, um, I don't know whether you guys are know anything about athletics, but I'll explain a little bit. It was called Club Mark. I'm sure Andy's probably heard of it. Um, where every single club that has a track has to have a folder that is a tick sheet, but you have to prove that you've got this kind of facility that is accessible. The accessible side of the folder was never, ever ticked because no one did it. And I went to one track um, because I said, look, we need to make sure that this folder is being regulated properly and it's not just oh yeah yeah we've got disabled toilets we've got a lift you know I went into a disabled toilet in a track and it was full of hurdles and I was like hmm okay I was like mm, no so I actually made them take everything out clean the toilet and made it I said if I ever come here again and find hurdles in there I will shut you down so they never did it again they were really good to be fair but I wanted to make sure Club Mark was fully inclusive and not just for mainstream athletics. Even though I came from mainstream athletics, I, I wanted to work in the Paralympic side because that's where I saw the most value. And I knew for a fact, I knew a few Paralympians that always felt like they were second class citizens. And that's something I never ever wanted to happen. So that's why I got into that sport and wanted to make every single track in the UK accessible. It feels to me that there's there, it, there's not a sort of a formal accountability when it comes to accessibility. I, so my football team works. We, we went to the first special European Championship finals in Benfica in February. And the foundation... Were you there? Did you? So, um, but with the foundations that we play with, like Manchester City or Everton or Salford City, who do our coaching, there, is, there are foundations that are ticking boxes to satisfy the outside CSR piece and there are foundations yep. that are legitimately trying to make the world a better place but yet you can kind of be whichever one you want and I wonder when that tipping point is going to come I hope it's soon it will be I think I think more and more people are becoming more aware that there's a lot of things that are not happening and that it is just a tick box exercise so if, if we make people more aware that you know this has to happen in real life not just let's all just tick the sheet and say yeah we're all inclusive if people actually start making statements to say hold on a minute you're not accessible then I think more and more people are going to be going oh right okay we, this is a reality now we have to make sure we do these things but it's if people don't come forward and complain I know the British don't like to complain God knows why everybody else seems to <laughs> but we never seem to complain and I think that's that's where we go wrong it's like if something's wrong stand up and make that change it seems like this, this, and this exhibition is representative of us. It's time for us to stand up and scream pretty loud. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, bang absolutely. on. Okay, second question. Um, and I'm going to pass this over to you, I think, sir, uh, given that your, the sport is, is relatively new and so you want to face these challenges. What are the potential physical and mental health benefits, would you say, of engaging in regular sports and fitness activities? Uh, yeah, I found... Um, all the sessions we've done so far have been um, very inclusive. We invite basically anybody to come down. And I can hand on heart say, and I think Andy, we've done a session with Andy, Andy can agree. Every time we've done one, people have gone, do we have to go? You know, I'm loving this. When can we do another one? Because it is different. It is, it is exciting. And I think because you're doing that and you're doing something different, and you're engaging in something that, especially American football, I, I go to the London games and I will literally walk up to people who might have a prosthetic leg or they're in a chair and say, have you ever thought about playing? And, and they do look at me like I've got two heads. And it's sort of, after you've spoke to them and explained what I do, they just light up their faces and think, oh my God, you know, I've never thought I could do this. So automatically, straight away, without even them starting to play or train their, their mental health and everything's already been lifted because they've suddenly found this, this, this new oh you know I can do something that I never thought I could do and another example would be 
um, there was a guy, so the London Monarchs were a massive team down in London, very good team in the day. Um, I got contacted by a guy who used to play for the Monarchs. Fortunately, he'd gone out to Afghanistan, came back in a chair. And this guy's now in his, in his middle 50s, and by the end of our Zoom conversation, he was in tears because he finally realised his love of American football hasn't got to stop. And he just, we keep in contact now and he can't wait for us to start a team up in London so we can come down and become one of our coaches. So again, even without taking part, just that being a part of something is lifting people's mental health. And as long as we can put a smile on people's faces, that's all that matters to me. For my limited experience, the, um, the make or break of these sorts of things is that there's people like yourself that are passionate and pioneering. Have you found that you've been restricted by funding? Because he sounded very confident that you would just go, just having just worked so out of the chair of our club and have to be responsible for the budget. And when you just have that you go and find people and you bring them in straight away, you said confidence um, that suggested that you were able to fund and back up the ability to keep people in. How's that? Am I being naive here? Are you going to tell me something very different and you're currently doing like the three-peak challenge ten times a week? <laughs> it is very difficult to get funding, um, especially because we are so new. Um, I get a lot of people saying, yeah, once you're up and running, you've got a league going and, and you're playing regular games, come back and see us. But to get to that point, we need the funding to start that. So I think I'm possibly different to everyone else on here that I'm a volunteer it's not my full time job yeah, no, uh, and yourself. so I do all these free um, the sessions we do are free because again it's, it's about getting people involved getting people started so there's, I don't want to put a budget in someone's way so even talking to people um, today and at other events they say yeah but I've got a budget yeah, we want to pay you and I say look keep that for when we get going let, let's, let's get going first um, and I do find a lot of places are very willing to help with giving us um, a space to, to put a session on for free and then obviously once that first session we can then go back and say look we want to do weekly sessions now but we're going to start paying now um, so it's yes and no, the, the funding, there is funding available but it's hard to get hold of so you would agree that without the volunteer network, this would be an impossible dream? Definitely. Without volunteers, I think not just in American football, but volunteers in whatever aspect you do, nothing would go forward. And Andy, I saw you smirk when... <laughs> you're not a poker player, are you? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a poker player. Um, look, I, I worked in education for over 20 years from um, a mainstream school to uh, specialist college education so I was an access to advisor for disability um, working with young people from the age of 16 to 25 going, going out doing home visits working with them because a lot of these young people themselves haven't been out of their room for five years so isolated due to autism, ADHD, PTSD, PT, PDA, um, other conditions, complex disabilities um, and uh, you know, going over to G about funding, it, it, it's hard work. I mean, I, I was lucky in some respects because I I started as a volunteer in, in our club. We moved forward. I worked really closely with British Wheelchair Basketball. And, you know, I had the opportunity to be uh, one of the England pathway head coaches for Loughborough University, um, working with a lot of GB young athletes. And um, you know, from when I left the specialist guys to take up the, the role as part of the Commonwealth Games. We were brought in because of the lack of in inclusion and engagement. Um, you know, it was only because obviously the BBC highlighted that in the Commonwealth Games that we, you know, we were brought in and, and you know, make change. Birmingham Wheelchair Basketball developed and created. I left my job. This is my freelance now. So yeah, there is a cost to what I do. Um, but from the analogy of going back to previously before I did freelance, everything I do was volunteer. So it's about passion and about enjoying the sport that you deliver. And, you know, without those people being part of that as a volunteer support and, and workforce, you can't move forward. But why, is it, why, does, why does disability or inclusion, but why does everybody have to think that it has to be free or you give your services for free? Why, why can't we be paid for it? 
Yeah, bang um, on. And you know, and and you know, I have a skill set, and I've talked to lots of different people over the years regards to their skill sets as well. And and I don't like to charge, you know, charge for what I do. But you know, this is my job. I've got to pay my bills as well. And you know, we 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 live in an environment in society where we're trying to potentially enable people to get employment regardless of a disability, non-disability condition, issue, mental health or just having a bad day, we want to go out there and deliver what we do to support the people in our community and make the world a better place and that's why we're called Make Change. Yeah, love that. And Matt, over to you, I suppose, given, given your role, this, this must be, you know, the benefits of, mental, for, for, of exercise for mental health, this must be front and centre of your, of what you offer, I suppose. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, mental and physical health are the key pillars, essentially, that we refer to or what, um, when it comes to physical activity, physical exercise. Everybody um, deserves the opportunity to engage in a physical activity or uh, exercise, go to the gym. Um, yes, there are funding, referral schemes from GPs, etc., going to gyms. However, the gym, the gym might have um, stairs going up to it and the lift breaks down 16 weeks of the year. So there's still those things to consider um, and where I'm really trying to pioneer throughout to boost this accessibility mission <laughs> that I feel I'm on in terms of fitness and um, yeah, just trying to support trying to support that opportunity I was telling you about, creating opportunities and um, the effects that we can get both physically and mentally by engaging in that, that everyone can do is, uh, you know, we wouldn't, everyone, as I said, deserves the opportunity. Miranda, I think you definitely wants to add there. <laughs> so... Um, so I would just like to ask my fellow panelists when you and the audience when you hear the word yoga What instantly comes to mind? Pain Downward dog <laughs> Breathing Pain <laughs> Relaxation Okay, so like most people I think you'd imagine hypermobile women in leggings doing pretzel poses and what I learned was that yoga is actually a form of meditation. It is not a physical workout. Yoga incorporates mindfulness, and you can do it with or without muscular action. So mindfulness basically brings, um, it basically uses, sorry, mindfulness basically uses bringing non-judgmental awareness to the body. And that can be done through mindful movement, mindful breathing, visualization, meditation, chanting, and a whole other bunch of relaxation techniques. Um, mindfulness has incredible benefits, both mental and physical, including lower blood pressure, um, improved sleep, you know, a boosted immune system, reduced stress, improved creativity, uh, improved concentration and focus, and overall ha happiness. Um, anyone can take part in yoga, and it, it's amazing. The actual word yoga means to unite. And for me, yoga helped unite me with my disability, and it also united me to the disabled community. And practicing yoga with other disabled people with all different impairments has been just life-changing for me. Yeah, so that's yoga. And Shelley, I wonder, given you're the, the, the pro in the room, is there, a, um, is there an unusual paradox between the benefits of mental health through exercise and then the anxieties of being in competitive sport through what you've seen in your journey? At what point, <laughs> at what point do the benefits end and the anxieties begin, I wonder? Um, I think they're constantly there, in all honesty. I mean, I went to um, the 96 Olympics and I was with athletes like Linford Christie, Sally Gunnell, Colin Jackson, and I was like, I was only 23 at the time. So my anxiety came was like, oh my God, I'm actually at the Olympic Games with these guys. You know, I completely forgot that I'd worked my backside off to actually get to the Olympic ga Games. 
yeah, I completely forgot about that. And I was like, oh my God, I'm with all these famous people. And then people were asking me for autographs. And then my anxiety was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I was like, oh God. <laughs> it's like, what have I done? <laughs> it's like, I'm at the Olympics and I'm like, I've got no support. And that, that was the biggest thing for me when, when I was competing. There was never anybody there to actually support the mental health side. So it's been a very, very long journey for athletes to actually get the mental health, mental health help. Um, when I retired in 2006, it was because I got injured. Um, I actually went over my ankle and bent my tibia. Yeah, that was painful. That was pain. Not yoga, that was definitely pain. <laughs> Um, but they, um, when, they had the, when they had the operation, they cut the nerve. So I, I've been left with a, a hidden disability where I have chronic pain syndrome in both legs. So, you know, I, I suffer every single day. And when I say suffer, sometimes it's so debilitating, I can't actually get out of bed. So I go back into my athlete mental state and try and get myself out of bed because it's like, right, you used to be an Olympian. And then people say to me, what do you mean you used to be an Olympian? You are an Olympian. So it's like you have to change your whole mindset all over again when you retire, but there's, there's no help afterwards, which for me is the biggest problem. And me, myself and Andy were talking about this earlier, weren't we? There is a massive, massive void there that needs to be filled because you're gonna get athletes where they're gonna be unable to get out of bed. They're, they're probably gonna end their life, which, you know, I do know quite a few athletes that have thought about it. I'll, I'll be honest, I did as well. Hey, you know, it's, uh... I am I'm quite an honest person. Um, I'm so sorry that I'm getting so upset. <laughs> it is real, yeah. This is not a community of time waste, it's a community of real life lived experience. No, no. You need to share your story. So, when I retired, um, I got injured and I didn't want to be here anymore because all I'd ever known was athletics. And I got so upset that I couldn't be that person anymore, but I had no, no help whatsoever. So, for two years, I hid away. In 2006, for two years, I actually hid away and didn't want to talk to anyone at all. Um, and I was depressed, 100%. Really did not want to be on this earth anymore because I'd lost everything. And I think this is, yeah, yeah. I think this is where we need to step up for these athletes and even the Paralympians, not just the Olympians, but the Paralympians as well because they are often thought as an afterthought and not as a forethought. Everyone is equal as far as I'm concerned, so it has to be a level playing field, which is the biggest thing for me, which is what I always try to make it, a level playing field. But the, the mental health side is, is quite debilitating when you sit there and all you can see is just blackness. And you don't feel like you've got any way of getting out of it. And with the Paralympian side, I saw that quite a fair bit, that no one was stepping up to actually help these guys. So I, I became a mentor for quite a few of the athletes because they knew I'd been through something as well, so they could relate to me and I could relate to them. And so I started mentoring and started helping them on the mental health side. Didn't get paid to do it because I didn't want to get paid to do it. I just, I just took it and, and just talked talk to these guys because nobody else wanted to talk to them because they, they, all they saw was the chair. They didn't see the person, which is one of the biggest things for me when so I ended up coaching coaches to coach disabled athletes because they were like, but they're in a chair. I don't know what to do with them. I was like, do you not see the person <laughs> that sat in that chair? You know, and it was so frustrating for me. And so I, I started helping coaches on their mental health because they then felt inadequate as a coach, so it, it, it comes full circle. And there's, there's so many avenues that, that mental health affects that people don't actually realize. And it's not just about the athletes, it's the coaches, the parents, the carers. You know, you, you, as an athlete, you, you are in the center, but you have such a big circle around you that you've got so many people that are in there 
and you don't see them to begin with, but it's only... <laughs> We're going, for, we're going for whiskeys after this. It's going to be amazing. I don't even, I don't even drink, but sometimes like, I wish I did. <laughs> Andy's been trying to get me drunk for the last two days. Put your hand up, Andy. Don't laugh. <laughs> um, I lost my dad last year, and my dad was my hero. And, um, he really was. Honestly, he was such an amazing bloke. And um, So everything that I do has, has a purpose, because it reflects my dad. I'm so sorry. <laughs> does, anyone feel, this off me. does anyone feel an apology was required? Because I know I don't. Um, I think what's really clear to me and is really humbling is that actually this is, there's so much newness to what we're all doing and, and those of you on the panel that actually you suffer and you are becoming the pioneers to get to the next level. We do a lot of work in uh, sport and one of the unusual things when we, when we meet athletic teams and we talk about injuries, we talk, when we go around the room and we want to understand people's sleep and how, how their performance is going. And whenever we've done these big talks, in, we, did, we recently worked with England Rugby League World Cup team, nobody has an injury. So you go around the room and you're asking these big burly rugby lads, you know, has anyone ever suffered with neck pain, back pain? And no one's got to say, no, I'm fine. And we kept having these talks and coming home, going, like, every athlete seems fine. And then we'd do a triage in the office where they'd come and have a consultation. And of course, the first chopper come in, yes, I broke my neck on the pitch, my ears have been ripped off, and I've had half my leg pulled off. What, what, what I realised, which is really interesting, and in terms of the psychology of sport, is you're in these talks, you're next to your competition. So your competition, you can't show your weakness to your competition. So you ha there, there is this hiding of mental health, because weakness demonstration in front of your coach, or telling them that your leg feels a bit wonky today, might get you out of the team and I don't know how you fix that in competitive sport I think that's a, a really challenging complete uh, you know impossible um, what do they say an unstoppable force and an immovable object that very much is that right so when I got to the Olympics I um, we were in a holding camp for two weeks and I was throwing really well, I, was like, I threw like 65 metres, which would have got me silver, but when I got to the track to compete, um, they hadn't laid the track properly, so there was, we have um, nine millimetre spikes in the heel, so when you plant your foot, you don't, you don't slide. The tartan track was only five mil. So I went to do a practice throw, planted, slid forward and um, had three micro tears in my Achilles. And that was before the competition even started. Um, yeah, mm. I got the physio. I said, strap me up. I've not come all the way over here just to sit there and watch other people throw. So I ended up throwing, um, but didn't throw very well because of my Achilles. But I still did it. Yeah, because if I, I think if I hadn't have done it, I think that would have just finished me off completely. Because I'd done all that training. Derek Redman, isn't it? Yeah, same, same exactly. I had a car accident in March 95, which was the, just literally before I got hit by a drunk driver head on they said I'd never throw again I started training again in August and then in December oh god I'm so accident prone it's ridiculous um, in December well, you oh god honestly this gets worse trust me um, I was hurdle bound and I, I tripped and well let's just say I broke my elbow in three places and it was my throwing arm as well and the usual stuff for saying oh yeah you're never going to throw again and I had to go I drove myself to the hospital after I'd finished training. Um, even though I knew I'd done my elbow and I still carried on training. Um, athlete, athlete mentality, it's just craziness. I still have it now, but I'm not as crazy this time. <laughs> um, so, one, 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 it's, a, it's a really weird story, but it's quite, I would like to say it is quite inspirational. Um, so, they, they were putting the plaster cast on and I was taking it off. They kept putting it back on, I kept taking it off, and I said, You're not putting me in a cast because you don't, you know, you don't immobilize a joint. Um, about four weeks later, I was back throwing. Five months after that, I was at the Olympics. So I just like... That, that's what can be achieved. Guys, we've got a few more questions I had for the panel, but seeing as we've only got such a limited amount of time, I thought it would be nice, given the uh, all-star cast that we have here, if anyone has any questions that they'd like to fire to the... Oh, yes, I'm so glad I did that. Okay, one and two, I'm going to go... Hello everybody, 
Uh, my name's Natalie. I'm a mum of 19-year-old uh, autistic um, children. Um, first point is I just want to thank the panel and every volunteer that helps all send young people access sport. My son is part of Sheffield FC Disability Football Club. Absolutely loves it and it gives him a sense of belonging. So all the parents, all the volunteers, you're absolute stars. My second point is, as a governor of a special school, how can we encourage the curriculum to put more sport and activity in? It seems to be the one subject that keeps getting pushed down and down. And these are the young people that need that exercise, that healthy living, looking after themselves. How can we address that? Um, from, from our point of view, we, we go and deliver inclusive adaptive sport all over the country. We do it in schools. I mean, locally, we do it in Birmingham and Leicester. Um, and what we found, obviously, I, I totally agree with you. The, the issue that we've got, obviously, pre-pandemic, you're talking about in mainstream schools. We were speaking to a teacher with 12 SEN children in their mainstream school. Now, after post-pandemic, they've got 65. But a lack of resources, a lack of training, and because, obviously, teachers, um, support staff are getting to a retirement age, they're not replacing them. Um, there needs to be a change, I totally agree. And the only way to move forward is to bring organisations in to support with inclusive adaptive sports, get them to look at that, have, have conversations with your uh, parent uh, organisations at PTAs and get the teachers to recognise when they go out through their uh, PE coordinators that these sports are, are in the community. I think there's a real discord between what teachers and the curriculum and how they want to present it to young people and what Ofsted are expecting. They're very much academically attainment and that's the challenge. Absolutely. Um, you know, I worked in a specialist college. Um, Ofsted come in, they look at more academic and about how, how you know, they're not interested in regards to um, student sports and how sports develop an impact on the person's mental health and their, their benefits to that. I think, as I said before, I think we need to have organisations come in, show teachers, give the training, use workshops to, to, to support that. And by doing that, we can showcase not only to disability but non-disability that inclusion is for everybody and supports that these sports, you know, wheelchair basketball, there's a misconception that you have to be a wheelchair user. That's not true. We have able-bodied players playing in our national league. Our classification is there for a purpose to support the, you know, the, the support from a disability to non-disability and get everybody playing together. And when we go into schools, we like the fact that you know these sports are for everybody and by adapting a sport everybody can play sport be included in sport be engaged in sport have fun and be safe in that thank you hi um, I was just wanting to ask the panel I'm an occupational therapist and I work in a perinatal mental health team, so women in pregnancy in two years after they've had a baby. I think sport's amazing, I think particularly team sport. Team sport. But the, I wanted to ask the panel about the barriers to women in sport, because half the girls drop out of sport by the time they're 17, regardless I mean, of having a physical... I just wanted to wonder how do we actually make it that women and girls see sport as a as a viable option because even getting them to consider it is a big barrier right now. One one of the barriers. One one of the barriers that I found with athletics um, when I wanted to do javelin, people were like, oh, you can't do that. I was like, why? Why can't I actually throw a javelin? Because it was, it was classed as a, as a, a manly kind of event to do. And, and then everyone started saying, oh, you don't want to look like Fatima Whitbread, you know, because they're muscular. So it's, it's unfortunately, it's when, when girls hear that kind of comment, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. And although nowadays, because you can actually go online and you can see what Fatima used to look like, that oh, I don't want to look like that. But nowadays, if you look at like discus throwers, female discus throwers, they're, they're like twigs. So, and now people are saying, well, now they're too skinny. You can't win. 
you just cannot win. Fatima ended up being my bloody coach as well, by the way, so which is even worse. And I was like, I don't want to be that muscular, thank you. But, you know, I did end up being quite muscular anyway. But it, it's, I think most of the time the perception is, is from um, what you see on TV and what girls see. And, but now it's like everyone's comfortable in their own skin now. And then next month it'll be something else. It's like, oh, right, OK, we need to be skinny again. Or, you know, so I don't think it's so much around sport. I think it's around what's on the media side of things and what people are looking at these days. Um, most of the girls that I know in sport used to wear running vests and long running tights. Now it's short crop tops and short, short shorts. So, and then next year it'll be long running tights again and vests. So I think it's more media than on the sporting side of things. It's how girls are perceived in sport. You know, where, where they, wear, they wear makeup as well. And people say, well, why are you wearing makeup when you're going to be sweating like, a, like a, a crazy person running around a track? And you've got, you look at it and you go, that's a good point, actually. But I, think, I don't think it's the sporting side of things. I actually do think it's the way media perceives sport. And I think that needs to change as well. More, more female athletes need to come out and actually explain what they do on their training sessions. I think that, in, in all sports as well, I think that would help massively. Yeah, going to get... So, American football, everyone sees that as a male aggressive sport. The women's GB team for American football are actually the second best team in the world. Uh, they recently only lost in a very, very tight game against America, which for me, I'll take that any day if, we, if, you know, if it's only the Americans that are beating us. But also, even at a younger age where, um, as a governing body, we do school programs and we work with NFL UK doing the school programs at the moment. And that has just finished in Tottenham, where the school that finished there is getting an all expenses paid to Miami. So every one of these skills has to have a minimum of three young girls on each team. So even in our sport, being a, normally a male-dominated sport, a lot of money and a lot of effort is going into encouraging more females to play, even from sort of eight upwards. And American football is actually one of the only contact sports where it can be mixed sex, even up to the likes of the NFL. So hopefully... You know, the more we can encourage ladies to play, the more we can encourage these young girls to play at school level, the more females we can get in and we can encourage you know, more people to play. Do you think, uh, f for me, what we discussed before, the, the principle of the volunteer network and its significance in the, the lifeblood of any organisation, my experience, I've been involved in our club for about 10 years, and for me, the obvious lacking thing that seems to, what could bring this all together is that the... There is a very limited encouragement of children volunteering um, and that then the confidence that actually volunteering gives uh, a child it's not just about you know what you're doing for other people it's the benefit for oneself of volunteering at a young age particularly those you know I find, so I've got two, two lads with ADHD that volunteer and while they're getting nailed in school for you know standing up and walking around and you know following the squirrels um, in the volunteering side of it, they are. This is where they actually Neymar, get their their strength. Come to reception. We have your son. That's Neymar. Please come to reception and registration list. We have your son. Yeah. In so in our, um, my my other role, I'm chairman of a, an American football team up in Chester. And for the, that example um, is great because I have a an autistic. He used to play for the youth and juniors because he loves American football. He got to a senior age and thought, I can't do this anymore. And his anxiety and everything just got to him before a game. So he's now our media manager and he is one of the best media guys that I've ever got on the team. And, you know, I couldn't do it without him. So uh, there is a position for everybody to volunteer. You know, it doesn't matter what someone's ability is. I spoke to someone yesterday who loves American football. He said, I'm too old to play. I said, well, have you ever thought about going out and helping out at your local club? So he said, no. I said, right, where do you live? I gave him the address of his local club. He's now going to go down there and see what he can do to help out. So, again, it's, it's getting the message out that it doesn't matter whether you have a disability or not. There's always something that you can do to help out. If you want to volunteer, you can volunteer. Do we have any more questions, ladies and gents?
Yes, we do. Here we go. Morning, panel. Um, I'm Jamie. I'm a specialist um, rehab therapist and a trainer. I'm on sabbatical. I'm also a disability rights activist. Um, two things. I, I fell out with Sport England over that exact issue um, because I got asked to try and encourage more disability sport. We're looking forward to London 2012. Got dropped sometimes very little time, maybe a year to two years out by um, a recently disabled paramilitary um, types. Great, you've given these people a route into sport, but you're only caring about the podium and you don't even give a shit about the athlete you just dumped. So that's not good. We need to care about everybody. Um, part of the thing as being a therapist and as being a disability rights activist, we need to shout about the good stuff because being visible gives us hope. And we need to give, I, I mentioned this at a trade show last month, we had a big fitness trade show right here in this hall. And to hear regulators going, oh, standards don't matter, accessibility don't matter, went, how dare you take someone's hope away? Because their hope might start in a cafe, their hope might start on a park bench. We need to have more informal taster sessions so people can see, they know that door has changed post pandemic, they might not have been out. So tell them the, the door's changed, it's now down the road. Be visible. Do informal sessions because people are fearful. You know, we as a community must need to shout a bit louder and we must help our members know their rights. So if you're going into an inaccessible space, say, uh, just to remind you, that's an offence, it's illegal to be inaccessible. And if I have to come back and remind you, I'm fining you a thousand pounds. So my thing, my question to the panel very quickly, do we need to go towards to more towards the community and, and less rely on the community coming towards providers? And how do we do that? Do we need to use more community provision in terms of being a collective rather than individual, being more of as a collective and saying, if the councils and the regulators don't want to put on stuff, we'll get together and put on stuff. We don't need a stadium, we don't need a box. We'll put it in the street, we have to. I think the reality, if you don't mind me answering that question, um, I think the reality is, I think the reality is that um, the thing's going to have to come itself organically. To me, it feels like if this sort of an exhibition three years ago simply wouldn't have had the, the interest and the excitement and the, the willingness to share and be a part of a community. And I think it has to be, I, I, whilst it would be really nice for there to be change, I think we have to expect there to be none and hope that we inspire, and particularly this panel, will inspire that there will be more of us and next year our army will be bigger and maybe the, we make the noise louder from within and people have to listen um, and that we don't have an expectation because largely we'll probably be disappointed at the end of it. Um, ladies and gents, I'm going to have to wrap that up simply because I think we went well over time. Thank you for your question, sir. Um, guys, we're all hanging around so I know that Andy is roughly where are you going to be? wheelchair over in the corner and then G you're going to be H11, H Matt B10, I'm on C23, have a go area and if you see any um, downward dog poses on a scooter it's probably going to be Miranda. Ladies and gents can we have a round of applause for our panel? <laughs>